Well, this is quite an honor. Joining us now, former Secretary of State, Treasury Secretary, and White House Chief of Staff James Baker. We also have NBC News senior correspondent Tom Brokaw, along with Mike Barnacle, Willie Geist, and of course Joe and me. And uh, Mr. Secretary, from a Chief of Staff perspective, um, I I'd love to know how you would characterize how this administration is being run. Well, I think they're getting some things done, and I have to um, confess to you that I voted for Donald Trump because I'm I'm a Republican mm -hmm. and I'm a conservative, and I thought the country was moving in the in the wrong direction. They've done some things right, uh, and they've done some things wrong, uh, which you might expect of any administration. Basically, I think the most important thing is that is that the president empower a strong. Chief of Staff, give him or her the authority to run the place and then back them up, mm -hmm. uh, and that they find a way to impose some sort of message discipline on the on the administration. If that person isn't Ryan Priebus, who 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 well, do you I, think I, could I, fill I, that position I, I'm not given saying, the dynamics? I'm not saying it shouldn't be Ryan Priebus. Ryan right. Priebus did a very fine job running the RNC the and did a good job in the campaign, and but he needs to be empowered. You have, mm -hmm. I, I said. Back in February, you got all these power centers in this White House, and they overlap, and they overlap across domestic and international mm -hmm. uh, things, and and so everybody is fighting for turf and jock, uh, jockeying for position, and you really, he really needs to to get a handle on that. We had a little of that in the Reagan administration in the first uh, months, and President Reagan was pretty good about saying, uh, -uh here's the way it's going to be. But how do you control a president who likes to tweet? And by the way, on his last Middle Eastern trip, he made a very strong speech in Saudi Arabia, for example, about the need of the Islamic world to get together on doing yeah. it. And then he goes to Europe and he kind of unwinds the relationship between the United States and Europe, and that gets the big play back here. Well, that gets the big play because the Atlantic Alliance has been the foundation of peace and security in Europe for over 40 years. And it's really important that we keep it going. And keeping it going and healthy means you have to manage it and you have to uh, work it and you, and you have to uh, stick with it. There were plenty of dis disagreements mm -hmm. when we were doing all that stuff with Europe, but you, but you don't. You don't take take those disagreements public. You, there are ways to get that done, I think. Joe has a question for you. Joe? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Secretary, how important is it to have a chief of staff that goes in and has the power to hire and fire? Has the power to say to the president, listen, I'll run this place, you run the country, but you've got to let me run this place. How important is that well, for any really, chief of it's staff? It's very, very important, Joe. And it's what I said when I when I uh, was answering Mika's question. He needs to empower a strong chief of staff. When when Reagan, you know, I ran, I led two campaigns against Ronald Reagan. Then he asked me to be his White House chief of staff, and he let me staff the White House, mm. uh, and I staffed it with people who understood government, who'd been in Washington. Before and who wanted to get things done, and I think that's one of the re one of the reasons we were able to uh, get something done. Willie, D -d does no, it, does this remind you uh, uh, maybe an extreme version of what we had the first year or so of Bill Clinton's administration, where there wasn't order in Clinton's administration, and he saw himself in the center of all activity. The door was always open. People were always coming to him. Is that the problem instead of having the type of structure you set up and Eisenhower set that, up, where that, it was a pyramid? That, that's part of the problem, but, but you need someone, you need, he needs to deputize and author, author, give authority to someone to mm -hmm. run that White House. And they badly need to prioritize the things that they're going to that they're going to focus on, right. and and the focus is shifting back and forth uh, every day. One day it's tax reform, one day it's health care, one day it's Russia, and and you really need to keep the focus on, keep your eye on the ball. That's the only way you're going to get stuff through the Congress. And we judge our presidents on the basis of, of how much of their policy proposals they can get enacted into law. Mr. Secretary, you're known as one of the great wise men of the Republican Party and of uh, American politics more broadly. So has this White House called you? Has the President of the United States picked up the phone and reached out to you since no. he became president? No, but no, but he did meet you. I met with him uh, in May during the, uh, during the election campaign. Has anyone reached and out to you from the White House? 
Uh, no, but I've been in there, and they, they uh, in, uh, to see Gary Cohn about a, a, a carbon dividends proposal that I think would be a perfect solution to this Paris Agreement problem. Uh, and I, I met with, uh, at the time, uh, Priebus was there, uh, Conway was there, Cohn was there. Uh, but, but they didn't adopt the proposal. <laughs> if, if, you got to sit, if you got to sit across that desk in the Oval Office from Donald Trump this afternoon, for example, beyond hiring a strong chief of staff, what would you say to him? What would you tell him about being president? Well, I think that I, I think it would be good if, if there were a peer in there, a peer that could look at him and say, you know, Ronald Reagan wrote in his uh, in his book, one thing I liked about Jim Baker was he'd tell me what he thought even though he knew I didn't want to hear it. And George Bush said the same thing. And that's the most important uh, quality, I think, that, a, that an assistant or a chief of staff certainly uh, can present to the president. You've got to be able to say, this doesn't make sense. Don't do it. Uh, I'm not sure there's anybody in there now that can say that to the president. Should he bag the wow. uh, Should he bag the climate change uh, treaty? I don't think. I, I would hope not. I'm a, I'm with Secretary of State Tillerson on that. I think it's. I think we ought to stay in it and renegotiate it. If it's if it's too onerous, fine. Do do, do like like we're doing with NAFTA. Make it better. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Another another uh, uh, possibility I would think would be to send it to the Senate. Send it, it's, it, Obama should have sent it to the Senate. It is a treaty. Come on. And he, he wanted to slip it through as an executive agreement. So President Trump could say, no, -uh, we're going to make it. We're going to send it to the Senate and we'll see if the American people are behind it. If the Senate doesn't vote for it, can't support it, we know that the American people might have Mike. serious reservations. Mr. Secretary, none of us here <clears throat> have a clue as to the daily tick-tock of the presidency in that Oval Office. You do. Could you school us on the importance of managing a president's time? What happens during the course of a day and what could be done to sort of minimize the chaos that seems to surround this Oval Office? Well, to the extent that there may be chaos in there, and I'm not acknowledging that it's chaos, but there are there are overlapping responsibilities and authorities. He, what, what he needs to do is make sure that he, that he enforces message discipline on that White House. And that means to some extent on himself as well, yeah. so that you can prioritize what your, what, your, uh, what your focus is. And he needs to resolve these internal mm -hmm. uh, uh, conflicts. That you're not ever going to get anything done um, adroitly if you don't get rid of the, all that internal conflict. Did you have the power to say no to people who wanted to see the president who came to your office first? Did you have the power we, to say we, no? We had a, yes, we had an understanding with the president. We, we had an understanding. Any cabinet officer that needed to see the president could see him within 24 hours or maybe less if, if it was yeah. urgent. Uh, but and, and any any one of them could see him alone if they wanted to. Right. But we had a deal with the president that he would debrief us on any of those meetings that he had with anybody alone, whether it was Bill Casey or Al Haig or, or, or whoever it might right. be, George Shultz. Uh, Tom Broca, do you agree and do you think this president has the capacity to, to what's the word, sort of uh, give himself a little bit of space between him and someone else who then is given the right to make decisions? Well, I would hope and so. I mean, there was all that talk about he was going to pivot and become more presidential. But what we're seeing, based on all the experiences that people in New York and other places had, he's operating as he did as a kind of wildcat entrepreneur in the real estate business. And he doesn't have much tolerance for hearing a contrary point of view. One of Mr. Baker's great lines, in my judgment, is that you don't go into a negotiation without looking at the issue through the eyes of your opponent mm -hmm. to try to understand that first. And you don't see that with him. I think the country, more than anything else, longs for the divisions in Washington to be healed and people to talk to each other. Doesn't mean they're going to arrive at the same place at the same time, but you ought to have some kind of a civil discourse. You know, the president has a good team. He has selected a very good cabinet. He has some really good people in there. He needs to 
empower them right. and listen to them. And not undermine and, them. And, and you know, and, and that may be difficult because as Tom indicated, he's been a sole, uh, mm -hmm. in effect, a sole proprietor, very successful businessman, ran a good business, did well, but he was the ultimate power and the ultimate authority. He didn't even have a board of directors to, mm -hmm. to right. which he had to answer, nor stockholders, public stockholders. So he's not used to, to doing it that and way. And not used to listening. We've been asking your chief of staff questions. Now I'm going to ask you a secretary of state question, <laughs> which is the America first posture of the of the Trump White House. We saw it again last week at NATO. We saw it at the G7. Is that an effective way to conduct ourselves in the world? It's not an ineffective way, uh, in my view, if you do it right. You have to be careful that you don't turn into an isolationist or into a totally protectionist uh, administration. But look. <laughs> Nobody thought that Donald Trump could uh, could win the presidency. He did it, and he did it in effect almost all by himself. Mm -hmm. Very few people would have told you on election night that he's going to be our next president. So he felt the pulse of the American people, and that's what the pulse is. Now, there are ways to do that. There are ways to safeguard America's interests without totally withdrawing uh, from the world the way we did in the aftermath of World War I, which generated a, a World War II. Does mm. it concern you, for example, to hear mm. Chancellor Merkel last week? Yeah, that, that concerns me, but I don't... We're going it alone? Yeah, well, I, that concerns me, but I don't, uh, uh, I don't think that the president is, is entirely to blame for that. It's a two-way street. Germany is running a humongous trade surplus that they ought not to be running against everybody, not just against us. But the, <clears throat> the the Atlantic Alliance is the, was the basis of peace and security in Europe for the full 40 years of the Cold War, and it's really important that the United States and Germany maintain a good relationship. Joe, jump back in. Well, Mr. Secretary, we're talking about Germany here, and Mika and I um, hosted an Atlantic Council meeting one year. Uh, where there were so many Germans that were so grateful to your old friend George H.W. Bush mm -hmm. for standing up for the reunification of Germany when the French and so many other people were standing in the way, but he was insistent. Modern Germany really, in large part, uh, owes a great deal to George H.W. Bush, and we all do. I just Could you reflect on the presidency of George H.W. Bush, a one-term president who, the further we get away from the four years he served, the more we realize what a great president he actually was on the world stage. Well, thank you for saying that, Joe, because one of the great joys of my uh, 87, uh, 87th year of life is that I'm seeing uh, the public begin to appreciate uh, what uh, George H.W. Bush did in his one-term presidency and do so during his lifetime. It's really rewarding to see that because he, I tell people, that, of course I'm biased, but I tell people it, he was the very best one-term president we've ever had and one of the very best presidents of all time. You look at some of the things he did. German unification was quite an accomplishment when you think about it. Uh, Joe, you mentioned that some of the people who were against it, you said the French. <laughs> yeah, the French were against it, but also so the Brits were against it, and also the Soviet Union was against it. And America and Germany together got that done. A very narrow window of opportunity, and we got it done. And that was because of the leadership of George H.W. Bush. Uh, Secretary James Baker, thank you so much. And Tom Brokaw, thank you as well. I haven't had a chance, to, neither has Jim, to say how much we uh, share the loss of your yeah. father. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, your dad and I did a lot of interviews together through the years, and we miss him. <laughs> he was tough, too, right? Yeah. He was plenty <laughs> tough. You Challenged bet, and if you. he disagreed with you, you'd say, uh-uh, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> we miss that yeah. so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you both. Thanks. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube, and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories, and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.